This may come as a surprise, but not everyone agrees on the meanings behind certain tough-to-grasp Bible passages. Shocking, right? Ever since the first century, that disagreement has been the source of much debate. In this lesson, we establish a basic understanding of the common prophetic views, the lenses around biblical prophecy. We'll also make an argument for avoiding the labels that often accompany these views. And finally, I have a little surprise for you at the end. So exciting! Let's face it, biblical prophecy can be ridiculously difficult to understand. When meanings seem hidden, people usually take or combine one of three approaches to biblical prophecy. They give up, they study up, or they make it up. These different approaches have led to a fog of confusion and competing schools of thought around certain biblical passages. To make understanding and discussing these varying views easier, human wisdom has reduced these ideas, these concepts, into single word terms. We also carry the innate tendency to label and categorize pretty much everything in our world. Unfortunately, this means we often extend these views into labels that we then apply to ourselves and to others. This can create an otherness within a body that's called to be united, which historically has birthed division. So my word of caution is this. We debate we don't divide. As you study out a troublesome passage and arrive at a position, I encourage you to watch your language as you discuss that position with others. You are not a preterist. You hold a preterist view of a particular passage. You are not a futurist. You hold a futurist view on certain scriptures. You are a son or daughter of God. Our identity is found in Him, not in our eschatology. In this next segment, we're going to deal with two major lenses and four minor lenses for understanding biblical prophecy. The major lenses color how we see through the minor, so each are important to understand. Major lenses. Dispensationalism versus covenantalism. Dispensationalism. Dispensational theology is the new kid on the block, having only emerged around the 1830s through the Plymouth Brethren and John Nelson Darby. Darby is credited with popularizing dispensationalism, futurism, and the idea of a pre-tribulation rapture. By the early 1900s, this influence established a stronghold in the church through the fantastic popularity of the Schofield Reference Bible. Published in 1909, this Bible sold over two million copies by the end of World War II. The Schofield Bible was one of the very first Bibles that had notes to explain the scriptures, which made it a great study tool for clergy and lay alike. Unfortunately, this also means that any theological errors were taught far and wide to an eager and accepting audience. While C.I. Schofield's notes should not be considered infallible, there are many who elevated them to the level of gospel truth. The cornerstone of dispensationalism is the idea that God is working out, or dispensing, his plan for national Israel through a series of chapters, or dispensations. Lines are therefore drawn through biblical history to establish these dispensations but there's disagreement as to where and how many of these lines should be drawn. Most folks who adhere to this view say there are between five and seven dispensations, which may carry titles like innocence, conscience, government, promise, need for a savior, grace, and new heaven and new earth. This leads us to God's people. Because this view places such importance on national Israel, the church, and it's almost 2,000 years of history, is considered to be only a parenthesis. God will yet again deal with the Jews. Essentially, God is not crafting one people unto himself, but two. 
Israel, and the church. This idea is underpinned by the image of Abraham's physical descendants, represented by Ishmael through Hagar, versus his spiritual descendants, represented by Isaac through Sarah and pointing to the believing church. Mind you, Hagar was two generations removed from Jacob, who became Israel, and therefore was never part of Israel, nor the covenant God promises Abraham in Genesis 17, 19. Adherents also believe a few promises made to Israel are still yet to be fulfilled, and therefore major covenants like the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant were not fulfilled by Jesus. To this end, dispensationalism says that the kingdom of God, predicted to come during the Roman Empire by God through the prophets, and by Jesus himself, failed to come during the Messiah's first arrival because the Jews rejected Jesus. This view holds that Jesus will return to establish a future earthly physical kingdom. Finally, dispensational theology places a strong emphasis on a literal hermeneutic, though it depends on who you talk to as to when that literalism is applied. Though well-intended, this literalizing of scripture is often carried too far when it's applied to the poetic idioms and heavenly imagery that are profuse in the Bible. Covenantalism. In contrast to dispensationalism's short life, covenantalism has been the predominant view across all church history and has only recently been eclipsed by dispensationalism's explosive popularity. Like dispensationalism, covenant theology sees biblical history in a series of movements, but its list is shorter, pointing to three main covenants. The covenant of works, the covenant of grace, and the covenant of redemption. Though this last one continues to be debated as to whether it is even a covenant at all. As far as God's people goes, covenantalism does not place an importance upon ethnic Israel, but holds to the idea of a single unified people of God, which includes both Jew and Gentile believers. This is confirmed in Galatians 4, 28 through 31, and Romans 9, 8 through 9. The covenantal lens sees the covenant of grace established between God and believing Israel at the Lord's Last Supper and sealed with Jesus's crucifixion resurrection and ascension as having been extended to the Gentiles, Acts 10, as was always part of the Old Testament plan. Spiritual Israel is, and always has been, faithful Israel, what we now call the church, descended from Abraham through Sarah and will continue generation after generation until Jesus comes again at the end of history. This view holds that all major covenants were fulfilled by Jesus during his first coming or, as in the case of unbelieving Jerusalem, dissolved by their rejection of the Messiah. The covenantal view regards the kingdom of God as already and not yet. Already indicates that God's word through the prophets came to pass just as he predicted on time and as planned. The kingdom was successfully inaugurated at Jesus' first coming and believers are citizens of that spiritual kingdom where Jesus is ruling and reigning in their hearts. The not yet points to the recognition that the material world is still under the curse of the fall. Death, disease, and decay remain, but will be dealt with when heaven and earth flee at the final white throne judgment in Revelation 20. Unlike dispensationalism's literal hermeneutic, covenantalism places more emphasis on understanding literary genres figurative language, and the surrounding text. However, like dispensationalism, when taken too far, covenantalism can also lead to error, mainly by spiritualizing texts that were not intended as symbolism by their author. This can develop into a kind of Christian liberalism to which dispensationalism and its literal hermeneutic offered a solution. Minor lenses. Four prophetic lenses. Okay. That was covenantalism and dispensationalism. Those are our two major competing lenses for not only making sense of the whole Bible, but for also helping us to understand those tougher prophetic passages. Next, we're going to discuss four minor lenses for understanding prophecy. Now, when I say these are minor lenses, that's not to minimize their importance. It's only to say that their focus is more targeted than the larger, more global frameworks we just discussed. For instance, nobody has a 100% futurist view of the Bible. We recognize that most of its accounts have occurred in the past, 
But there are certain prophecies that are still awaiting fulfillment. Whereas we can apply a covenantal or dispensational lens to the entire word, these next four lenses are applied to specific scriptures. Just a word of caution. Not all lenses here are created equal. Some lenses work in some places and some, well, you'll see. Futurism. I bet you can't guess what this one's all about. True to its namesake, a futurist view takes the position that a prophetic scripture is waiting to be fulfilled. Today, this lens often gets applied to pieces of Daniel, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and other prophets, and in the New Testament, to the Olivet Discourse, 1 Thessalonians, Revelation, and more. It is the favorite lens of dispensationalism, as in many who claim dispensationalism also lean heavily into futurism, but certainly anyone holding to covenantal theology can take a futurist perspective. Every prophecy is born through the futurist lens, whether in the Old Testament or New. That is, after all, what prophecy is a foretelling of future events. However, we also recognize that many of those once future prophecies have already come to pass. For those prophecies, then, we would hold a preterist lens. More on that in a moment. Futurist example. Though there could be many examples of futurism, there is also a lot of disagreement on which prophecies are actually still yet to be fulfilled. One outstanding prophecy most everyone can agree on is the final judgment at the end of history, the white throne judgment of Revelation 20, 11. The weakness of this lens is the tendency to literalize misunderstood passages. When a futurist lens is applied to scripture taken out of context, usually because we don't know our history or the old Jewish expressions, all sorts of wild constructs can and do emerge. And then there's the charts. Lots of charts. This wrestling has been happening ever since the Old Testament. An example from the New, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3, shows us the church of Thessalonica was concerned they had somehow missed the second coming. The tension between futurism and preterism has been around a long time. Preterism. If futurism points to future prophetic fulfillment, preterism, from praetor, Latin for past, points to past fulfillment. Like futurism, preterism is a vital lens for understanding biblical prophecy, and also like futurism, people don't agree on when to apply it. At some point, we recognize that all prophecy will be viewed through a preterist lens because this earth's history will come to a close. Until then, however, the debate goes on. Preterist example. If you believe the Jewish Messiah has already come, you have a preterist view of those messianic prophecies. You believe those prophecies have been fulfilled. If you believe he will come again, you hold a futurist view of those prophecies surrounding his second coming. Make sense? Where futurism can fall into literalizing, preterism can fall into allegorizing. While one of preterism's superpowers is its ability to connect scripture with history, some folks might take this view a little too far. They conclude events like the resurrection, the second coming, the white throne judgment have already happened, usually in some spiritual way. This is called hyperpreterism or full preterism and is largely considered to be heretical. While futurist or preterist lenses are applied largely across both Old and New Testaments, the book of Revelation tends to be the primary focal point for our last two lenses, historicism and idealism. In contrast to our first two minor lenses, these lenses seem a little more blurry. Historicism. If futurism finds its prophetic fulfillment in the future and preterism finds its fulfillment in the past, historicism finds its fulfillment spread across the ages. It's important to note that the early church fathers never really ran with this one until uh, Joachim of Fiore in the 1100s. Historicism finally gained its popularity during the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s when the reformers cast the Pope as the Antichrist and assumed the Catholic Church was the beast in Revelation 12 and 13, and therefore the driving force behind end times apostasy. Historicist example. Most agree Revelation 2 and 3, 
speak directly to first century local churches during John's time. Not historicism. Historicism spiritualizes these churches and their admonitions into the ages of the church down through the centuries, beginning with the apostolic church, Ephesus, and extending to today's church, the lukewarm Laodicea. Though historicism remained popular until the 19th century, it largely faded due to its liberal interpretations and the lack of agreement between its proponents. One of its ongoing flaws? Historicist proponents invariably make the final segment in their prophetic timelines their own generation, which has been changing generation after generation for centuries. This view also ignores large swaths of prophetic details in order to fit its fluid scenarios. Today, Seventh-day Adventists are probably the largest holders of this view, but it is shared among some Lutheran and Presbyterian branches, and it was previously favored by the Millerites. Idealism. And so we arrive at the last of our minor lenses, idealism. If you thought historicism allegorizes, buckle up. This one allegorizes everything. Idealism is also known as the allegorical, spiritual, or non-literal approach. While both futurism and preterism recognize prophetic symbology in their own ways, idealism sees everything as symbology. This view holds that none of the prophecies in Revelation will ever find any literal earthly fulfillment aside from maybe the second coming and the white throne judgment. These prophecies are simply figurative language for all of the tribulation and strife that confronts Christianity in every age. Idealism began to flourish only in the past 200 years. In the 1800s, Swiss Calvinist theologian Karl Barth interpreted eschatology as a collection of existential truths designed to bring the believer hope rather than a series of past-future symbol-rich prophecies. His teachings provided the undergirding for what would be called the social gospel in America, which aims to solve society's many ails via the expression of the Christian ethic. Idealist example. This lens pretty well allegorizes whatever it sees. Through idealism, the beast of Revelation has been said to symbolize wealth, the elite, the exploitation of workers, imperialism, materialism, and the government. Yeah, pretty much whatever oppressive system you want it to mean. Christian science, the New Thought Movement, and the Unity Church, all metaphysical transcendentalist organizations, lean heavily upon this lens. Enough said. Surprise! Pop quiz! Well, surprise! Just a little exercise to help you think through all these isms. Hey, don't thank me. That's why y'all are paying me the big bucks. Which lens? You believe God is crafting to himself one people made up of many nations. This began with Abraham and has continued generation after generation until the present day. Your position is A. Covenantal B. Dispensational C. Idealist D. Preterist or E. Futurist If you said A. Covenantal, you're right. Question two. You believe God has a separate plan for national ethnic Israel and another plan for his church. Your position is A. Covenantal, B. Dispensational, C. Idealist, D. Preterist, or E. Futurist. If you said B. Dispensational, you're right. Question three. In regards to the messianic prophecies, you believe the promised Messiah has not yet come to humanity. Your view of these prophecies is A. Preterist, B. Futurist, C. Idealist, or D. Historicist. If you said B, futurist, you're right. Question four. You believe the Messiah was born, crucified, died, rose, and now is seated at the Father's right hand in fulfillment of Isaiah 53 and other prophecies. 
your view of these prophecies is A. Futurist B. Preterist C. Historicist or D. Idealist If you said C. Historicist, you're wrong! <laughs> the answer is B. Preterist. Question 5. You believe Revelation unpacks the ages of the church throughout the centuries. Your view of this book is A. Preterist, B. Futurist, C. Idealist, or D. Historicist. If you said D. Historicist, you're right. The end is nigh. Woo, that was great. I love me some pop quizzes. If you were unfamiliar with these terms when we started, I know this lesson might have been a bit thick. As we continue through the prophecy course, I do make an effort to keep the high-minded theological lingo to a minimum, but I did feel that it was important for you to have a sense for these varying perspectives. And don't worry. There's more isms to come. The tribulation and the millennial reign of Christ will introduce us to a few more fancy terms. But alas, those are lessons for another day. I hope this lesson helped you grow in your understanding. Remember, it's the truth that sets you free.